Welcome back to another World Audiobooks. I am so, so excited today, and I know I always say that, but today I'm doubly excited because I am bringing you a very special bonus episode that is a bonus of a bonus episode. There are so many awesome podcasts out in the world today, but with all those awesome podcasts, it can be hard to choose the one that you know that you're going to like. Well, if you like Another World Audiobooks, and I'm guessing based on the fact that you're listening to this that you do, then I have good news. Today, I get to introduce you to a podcast that I love and one that I know that you are going to love. My friend Heather over at the Craft Lit podcast has been so generous as to allow me to publish not one, but two of her episodes in this very special bonus Another World Audiobooks episode. Because I wanted to introduce you to an awesome podcast that you need to go and subscribe and follow and start listening to because they've been going for a long time. Uh, like this, this episode is back from 2011, um, and the the podcast has been ongoing for even years before that. So if if you get tired of podcasts that don't put out enough content, Craftlet is not one of those podcasts. You have an amazing, incredible, awesome backlist to go listen to. So I highly recommend that you listen to this, get a, a feel for the podcast, and if you like it, go and search Craftlet wherever you listen to podcasts. Podcasts, and you will find it is a, a very well-established, awesome audiobook podcast. And they do things a little bit differently than Another World Audiobook. So not only do you get the, the audio of the audiobook, you also get some annotations around that to really flesh out the book, the author, the time period, and just all the context around some of these classic, awesome audiobooks that are out there. I am just absolutely floored and honored and uh, just super happy to be able to bring this to you. And like I said, if you enjoy it at all, go and subscribe to Craftlet. Hopefully this is your next uh, podcast uh, addiction that you can add right next to Another World Audiobooks. And uh, yeah, just make sure to check it out. And if you like it, please get in touch with Heather. You can check out all their stuff. Just search Craftlit in, uh, in, in Google or whatever, and it'll pop right up. Craftlit um, on all the social media platforms, and they have a cool website, too, with a bunch of their past episodes and all kinds of awesome stuff. So make sure to check it out. This is not just for crafters. I know they, they put it in their, in their title. It is Craftlit, but really, this is if you enjoy audiobooks, and uh, I'm assuming, again, I'm assuming you do since you listen to this show, then you are going to love it. So thank you, Heather, for allowing me to uh, share this with my audience, and thank you, audience, for listening and supporting what Heather is doing over at Craftlit. So now, without further ado, I give you a very special bonus episode from the Craft Lit Podcast. Welcome to Craft Lit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from my corner of the Sonoran Desert, the Old Pueblo, Tucson, Arizona. Episode 192, Snowblind. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by Knitting Out Loud. Listen while you knit. You can find out more about Knitting Out Loud's full catalog at www.knittingoutloud.com. Also, Knit Circus, the online magazine featuring three rings of knitting, sewing, and fun. You can find out more and see the latest issue at www.knitcircus.com Well, hello! It has been eons, eons, epochs, epochs, since I last spoke with y'all. And there are reasons for that. The first and most obvious reason for my prolonged absence is that I have been uh, editing and getting out to Ms. Shannon Oki of Cooperative Press and Girl, Girl, uh, I've been getting out a fantastic book of knitting patterns, crochet patterns, fabulous essays on topics, oh, all sorts of topics, and, um, and recipes. Yes, it is a multi-crafty book, not unlike what one might imagine would come from the people who bring you Craftlet. And new designers in the book, designers who you have seen before in the book, all sorts of really nifty, fabulous stuff. If you listen to Brenda Dane, you've heard her talking about the brilliant pattern she came up with. And, uh, and if you're up on Facebook, you may have seen uh, Erica, one of our designers, talking about her pattern, me talking about my pattern, Hunter over at Violently Domestic talking about one of her patterns. It's all really quite thrilling. And uh, if you are a crocheter, there are three 
if I may say so myself, excellent patterns that have come in uh, into the crochet arena from Dawn at Crochet Compulsive. And, uh, and gosh, I just... You know, it was it was really hard because you know how when you're working on something that's really quite difficult and also beautiful, whether it's a painting or a sculpture or a piece of jewelry, you know, fill in the blank. When you've done it, you just you want to show everyone. It's like Stephanie Pearl McPhee talking about how every time she turns a sock heel, she wants to stand up on a table and go, look what I did. It is much the same with compiling, editing and designing for a book that I had some of the artwork that our own Jen Minnis of Jen Minnis Designs uh, has done for the book. Brilliant, amazing stuff. And I had some of it on my phone and I kept wanting to like show it to random strangers going, isn't it gorgeous? Look at this, isn't it great? So I'm, I'm a little over the moon, but I'm also really exhausted. That kicked my butt in ways that I had not anticipated. Wrangling... Uh, 21 patterns and I think 12 designers. That was a lot, a lot of work. Good work, you know, but a lot of work. And, you know, I hear you. You might be saying to yourself, self, I'm not a knitter. Why should I care about this book? I mean, aside from the fact that I listen to Craftlet and Heather and blah, blah, blah. Here's the deal that is so exciting about this book. And this is 100% because uh, Zabette Stewart over at the Anticraft, hooked me up with Shannon Oki of Knit Girl and Cooperative Press. And because Shannon is forward thinking and uh, interested in game changing and breaking the mold and all of those things, uh, we are lucky because here's the deal. You may know if you've listened to Cast On, for any length of time or gone back and listened to the old the old shows um you know because brenda talked about it before that designers are not paid a living wage designers uh who sell their stuff individually in, independently on ravelry they can if they the word spreads and their designs are good enough they can you know make a dent in paying their bills but designers who design for books that are put out by big publishers they really don't um in fact i i know there are some designers who have designed and been, even been, you know, promised a copy of the book and never managed to get that much, uh, much less, you know, a cash payment, which really stinks because it's a lot of work to design a knit or a crochet pattern or, you know, anything. Any, any of you crafty people, you know how much time and effort goes into creating anything. Well, one of the things that I said when Shannon and I first talked was I obviously I don't have money to pay my designers up front, but I also don't want to put it in the contract with them that they are going to get a fee. It's like, here, $100 in a copy of the book. Knock yourselves out and buy yourself a coffee at Starbucks if you can still do that for 100 bucks. Instead, I wanted to pay them in shares of whatever money we make from the book. So <laughs> nobody does this. This is not done. But because Shannon is the coolest person in the world, Shannon's response was, oh yeah, no, we can absolutely do that. I'll help you write the contract. We'll make sure that your designers are covered, paid. Now, if this book doesn't sell and, you know, it's a epic flop and I'm embarrassed and mortified and, and heartbroken and crushed, then we were wrong and this was a bad idea. If this goes well, this is pretty groundbreaking stuff because it means that this group of designers could, could actually make enough money to pay some bills and maybe take their kids out for ice cream. It's potentially huge. It is potentially game-changing. So when I get really excited about the book, it's it's only sort of a vanity thing, really. I want this to change things and maybe become a model for how designers are treated, you know, in the future. 
when books come out. And I also, I really firmly believe that what Shannon is trying to do with with our book and, and with her other books, oh, Hunter from Violently Domestic is coming out with Silk Road Socks from Shannon. Uh, it, God, any day it's coming out. And wow, is that book gorgeous. I mean, holy smoke. If you saw the colophon pattern at the um, craftlit.com page, that's Hunter. And she did socks for our book that are awesome. But she has her own book that's that's coming out first. And I, I, oh, wow. I mean, Shannon is finding people that are getting turned down from standard publishing houses. And it's a shame because she's into the art and the history and the knitting and the beauty. And uh, we're just so lucky. We're lucky that she's taken a chance on us. And we're lucky that she exists at all and that her company exists at all and we're just lucky to have you there as well because i hope you enjoy this book as much as we have enjoyed putting it together and so of course you know this all goes back to all of this is happening right before christmas which is insanity in itself and then and here's here's the big news and then um it turns out we're moving Yes, I know. I was letting that sink in for a moment. So here's the dealie, yo. Uh, I think I told you that uh, many months ago, my husband was laid off when the entire division of his company was eviscerated and uh, turned out to be a great thing. Uh, we certainly got to see more of the hubbo, which was wonderful. And, uh, you know, we survived. And of course... Christmas week, he got two job offers. One that was in Tucson, he got first. We were very excited about that because, of course, you know, no move. Really good group of people at this school district. Exciting. Actually, one of our listeners from hundreds of years ago, from way back at the beginning, she's a teacher in this district when you talk about a small world. I mean, really, it's ridiculous. Uh, but uh, another deal came along. Uh, let's see, this would be the 20, <laughs> the 27th, we got confirmation. <laughs> Merry Christmas, a little bit late. And, uh, and the job that is in Virginia is, um, it's really, it's massive, it's huge. It's working uh, at a very large international not-for-profit in uh, Alexandria? Yes, in Alexandria, Virginia. So here we go. Andrew will be moving in a week. I will be single mothering temporarily. I will be packing the house on my own. I will be doing publicity for the book and podcasting. And wait, it gets better. I've had to go back to teaching this semester because uh, I haven't had an income for a while. And that turns out to be not such a great thing. So... I'm a little nervous about what the next six months are going to look like, but I'm excited. You know, it's good. It's all good. It's all good. So for those of you who are new to the podcast, you are now up to speed on everything. There's a book coming out. I'm moving to Virginia. Uh, I have two kids. I have a husband. And up until the summer, we will have been living in Tucson. And then I will have to find some other way to introduce the podcast because <laughs> I won't be in the old Pueblo Tucson, Arizona anymore. <sighs> Life is interesting, no? <laughs> well, in the intervening month since last you heard from me, along with all of the other, you know, y you can imagine, uh, Christmas presents and Christmas cards and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and all that kind of stuff that it's been pouring into the mailboxes. Along with that, there are a few pieces of important information that I really did want to get out to you. And, and in fact, I wanted to get them out to you earlier, but I seriously could not get to a microphone. Now, there are two reasons for that. One is I didn't have time. And two, we had talked about me doing short stories. And in fact, I found some, I found some great short stories. Uh, one of the suggestions, which I think was on Ravelry in the forum was uh, to do Bernice Bob Bob's Her Hair. It's an F. Scott Fitzgerald story. It is luscious. It has a wonderful kick and ending that you don't get the full force of until literally the last second. 
wasn't really Christmassy, you know? And, P.S., the reader of it on LibriVox, it was not something I wanted to do to you. And I didn't have time to re-record it myself, nor did my husband. So, that is on hold. And if anyone wants to read it, that we can, you know, so we can use it as an incidental or after Women in White, our next book, um, please feel free. Just let me know you're doing it before you record in case someone else has already stepped in. So that's, that's number one. Bernice Bob's Her Hair, fabulous. Second set of short stories that I found, going back years now, uh, Edna Ferber has a book of short stories called Butter Side Down or Buttered Side Down like you know the piece of toast if it falls butter side up then you were in luck and if it falls butter side down you were kind of unlucky well edna ferber has a whole book of short stories where she's trying to turn the and they lived happily ever after paradigm kind of on its head and they're beautiful they're heartbreaking they're painful they're lovely they are so not christmas stories or even new year's stories they're kind of i don't want to say they're downers but they're awfully realistic. Now, we will wind up listening to these Edna Ferber stories, however, in the future, and there are some good reasons for that. One of which is that they are brilliant. I mean, Edna Ferber, if you don't remember, if you didn't listen to those short stories, you know, back in 2006, uh, Edna Ferber wrote Showboat, along with a bunch of other stuff. And unfortunately, like many uh, writers who are particular to their day and era and time, um, th- her stuff is kind of, I-, I wouldn't say it's on the dustbin of history, but people don't read her the way that they read Fitzgerald or Hemingway. I, having listened to Ferber's stuff a couple of times over the break, I, I actually think it's probably because her books are not only, reg- or at least these short stories, are not only regionalist short stories in that they are very specific to Chicago, But they are also very female-oriented. I learned things about a woman's life back in the 20s that I had never known. And this is coming from someone who has studied that kind of history for theater. You know, in order to do set dressing properly or costumes properly or hair properly. I had to spend an awful lot of time in school and on my own studying that aspect of history. And even with, you know, what, 20 years of paying attention to that stuff, I learned things that I'd never heard before, never learned, never dreamt were real. And so, I really do want to do Ferber. And, you know, if you have the urge, don't hesitate to go to LibriVox.org and download Buttered Side Down from Edna Ferber, because the readers are quite good. And the stories uh, you just won't believe <laughs> the little the little details of everyday life that get communicated in her stories. They're just fantastic. All of that being said, we are about to walk into an amazing Victorian novel, uh, predating Connecticut Yankee, predating Flatland. Um, golly, I actually think... It may even be... Oh, it's not predating Hawthorne. It's not. Uh, But it might be predating Jekyll and Hyde. Ooh, I'm going to have to calculate some dates. Anyway, it's uh, fascinating. It's so fascinating. Woman in White. All of you listeners who have been telling me for the last, I don't know how many years, to do Women in White, you are geniuses and you must all pat yourselves on the back with big loving hands because you are so right. This book is so good. I actually forced my husband to download it onto his Kindle and he did exactly what I did. The first three chapters, he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exposition, 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 blah, 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 blah. And then I noticed that he couldn't put it down. And it stayed that way all the way up until the last two or three chapters, which strangely slow down again. It's almost like the book has two or three endings, but that will not stop us from enjoying this. Now, the corollary to all of that is this. If you are among the people who skipped Connecticut Yankee, I invite you 
to go back and look at the very last page of show notes for Connecticut Yankee. I think it's 88, 87 and 88. Uh, I, I beg you, I beg you, go look at the comments that people left in the show notes. Now, of course, not everybody was thrilled with the book. That is true of so many books. And I, you know, I don't take it personally. You're perfectly free to have your own opinion. But if you thought you knew where the book was going, and that was why you tuned out, I beg you to go back and listen and finish the book and, re- and listen, you know, to all of it. It's... It, it, there's important stuff that happens. But really, the last like 10 chapters, and it's a long book, the last 10 chapters really, it's just criminal that this book isn't studied anymore because Twain, Twain's assessment of human frailty and weakness and hubris are... Well, uh, nothing short of prescient. I mean, he wrote it in 1885. And for those of you who were listening with me until the bitter end, you know, 1918 was many years off. And yet, there's Twain. So, enough said. Now, I do have some announcements, like I said, that have been coming in from listeners. So, I wanted to let you know. Uh, First off, Tuesday, March 8th, 2011, is the Centenary of International Women's Day. And I got this email. Uh, it's about, uh, this is a knitting project. Um, I will read this to you. We are coming together for International Women's Day to celebrate and look to women for solutions, for stories, and for inspiration. We are bringing together 100 events that will be hosted at Glasgow's Tramway and Hidden Gardens on Tuesday, the 8th of March, including... Speakers, storytellers, visual artists, dance, music, film, and a massive amount of knitting. We are trying to provoke Scotland into asking questions regarding women in 2011 by collectively knitting between 60 and 100 million stitches to exhibit as a backdrop to this event. That, my friend, is a 21-kilometer scarf or one massive blanket. Why the big blanket? Because democracies have shown that there are between 60 million and 100 million females missing from today's global population. Okay? That's actual, like, research. Uh, Cheryl Woodun uh, wrote a book called Half the Sky, which investigates the oppression of women globally. Her stories will shock you. Only when women in developing countries have equal access to education and economic opportunity will we be using all of our human resources. And, you know, not not to slight the men who are listening, because we know our male listeners are the most fabulous people in the world, because craftlet listeners are the most fabulous people in the world. Um, You know, when the UN goes to make the the microloans and stuff, which they've been doing for, what, the last 15 years or so, they're they're giving them to the women because they know when they give women money, that money gets plowed back into the local economy and benefits families and children and helps the families uh, in that locality move on to the next stage of economic development. Money invested in women, I guess the way of saying it, money invested in women is rarely wasted. Um, and, and so I think Cheryl Woodun's uh, book is very interesting, but also this, this whole idea of knitting a 21-kilometer scarf, somewhere between 60 and 100 million stitches, is a really neat idea. So we are asking you to get involved. Here's how. One, knit a square and send it to us. And I have the address and I have uh, links in the show notes for you to find out more where to send these knit squares, how big you should knit them and all that stuff. Plus I have a link to uh, Cheryl Woodun's uh, TED talk because she was featured on the uh, TED forum. If you are not familiar with TED speeches, you really should be because some really amazing people have spoken at the TED conferences. So that was the first thing. Uh, Second thing, little bit of a promo. there's a new podcast by a longtime listener. The new podcast is called Clothed in the Lamb, L-A-M-B. And um, 
uh, we got mentioned in her podcast, which is very exciting in episode two. But uh, the website for that is www.clothedinthelamb.com. It's all one word. And uh, Janine is the host of that. And uh, it's kind of a kind of a combo of knitting, peaceful, kind of a spiritual, religious angle on it. It's very nice, very soothing. So, Janine has that for you. Then, we also have, for your listening pleasure, another uh, new podcast. This is from Deborah. She is very excited. She's listed on iTunes and on Podcast Alley. She is on, uh, on the web also at Craft patience.com that's all one word c-r-a-f-t-p-a-t-i-e-n-c-e dot com so here is a promo from deborah craft patience is a podcast about infusing my life with a little bit of patience through crafts while rediscovering my creativity regular segments will include on the crafting front on the shelf or newly bookmarked through my earbuds, in my journal, and on my mind. The crafts that I enjoy at this point in my life are primarily knitting and spinning, though I'm sure other crafts will make guest appearances. On the Shelf or Newly Bookmarked chronicles books and websites that I enjoy, whether fiber-related, craft-related, or just something I found intriguing. Through my earbuds gives you a sneak peek at a podcast or two that I enjoy listening to. I have written in journals since I was a child, and in my journal... I will share a thought or two that I've written since I last recorded. Now, hold on. I promise I'm not going to be sharing anything private that should be said to my therapist and not to you. And since I'm 100% certain that I'll have a non sequitur or two, I've reserved on my mind for random thoughts about what I do when I'm not crafting. I will also have a segment for listener feedback, also known as From the Mailbag, as well as I Wonder in which I invite you to interact with me on a specific topic. I look forward to sharing my craft life with you. I am a small town girl. I am a wife. I am a mother. I am a daughter. I'll craft patience into my life this week and tell you about how I did next time. Thanks for listening. I thought her promo was fascinating because she really put in a lot of thought to the organization and structure of the podcast. And I, you know, I, I don't have time to listen to tons, although now that I'll be commuting down to teach again, I'm going to have more time. And, you know, I kind of have my, my old favorites that I've been listening to for years. But when, you know, when someone's put that much effort into planning the structure and kind of gives you that almost Brechtian heads up of here's how, here's how I see it happening. It's, um, you know that with a structure there, you're, you have a better idea of what you're getting. And it's nice. It's nice. Because, you know, Craftlet has been going on for so long. The structure is I yammer and then I explain what you need to know about a book and then we listen to the book. I don't do, you know, music or, or essays really or, or anything like that. Whereas you know, like Brenda's show, um, she's, she's had a, a fairly consistent structure and she, you know, she just changed some of that, some of that, but her, her show, even though some of the episodes are shorter now, which is, you know, always a drag. Cause I love listening to Brenda like everybody else does. Uh, I don't feel like her show has really organically changed all that much. And that's very nice. Cause I know she was kind of stressed about, uh, about making, making these changes. And so I, I think it's, Again, because the the format was so comfortable and familiar, even though the changes that she made felt like big ones to her, to me it still, and I, I hope, I think to other people too, it still feels like, oh, well, it's still cast on. You know, it's still the show that we love. And I just, going into it, I, Deborah's podcast feels, you know, very similar already that you kind of walk in the door knowing 
who you're talking to. And that's very comfortable and familiar. So I'm really excited. We have Clothed in the Lamb and we have uh, Deborah's Craft Patients. And Lord knows I could use a little bit more patience right now because... It's a little stressful. Uh, I also have a link to a cloth, paper, scissors video on easy image transfers. And I have a couple of other cloth, paper, scissors um, videos to share um, with you that I used. I'm trying to remember which one it was. I've already put the link up. Uh, I can't remember. It, they were stuff that I did. Uh, these videos were things that I did for Christmas presents because, you know, not surprisingly, this year was another year of giving things that I'd made. And this year I really branched out into that multi-crafty world and I painted for people. Some of them were the little art cards. I did little art cards of Tintern Abbey uh, from pictures that I took, but some of them were completely new kind of collage collaboratively kinds of things. And I was very inspired by Jen Menace. Uh, our designer for What Would Madame Defarge Knit. So, if you didn't see the fabulous stuff from Jen, you should toodle over to www.mdfk.com. You can get there from the Craftlet show notes page. There's a button. And um, Jen did free, free to you, free in perpetuity. They will live on the web forever. Free Christmas cards that you can download and print and use forever with our blessing. Uh, they're little Tiny Tim Christmas cards, and she did a, a variety of them. Uh, some of them funny, some of them poignant, but all of them free and available to you. And soon there will be gift tags. I didn't have time to put the gift tags up, but they are done and they are going to be available to you for future holiday seasons, if you so desire. Um, the blog hop, the Dickensian blog hop did great things. We had lots of fun. And if you haven't had Smoking Bishop yet, you really need to get your act together and go smoke some Bishop. That's what I'm saying. So uh, all of that is available at the mamaonits.com website. Uh, the blog hop, if you are unfamiliar with it, um, was a very easy way to hop from blog to blog, getting information about how to create your own Dickensian holiday. And even though I know Christmas is past, Christmas will come again. I promise. And uh, you can learn how to roast a goose. You can learn how to make, uh, I want to say fruitcake. It's not a uh, Christmas pudding. Tons, tons of stuff available to you for free on the web. And that same blog hop idea will be employed later this month as we gear up to the release of What Would Madame Defarge Knit. And we will have all sorts of nifty things, knit-alongs and super fantastic uh, other stuff, <laughs> recipe links and pattern links and informational links and just, uh, it goes on and on. There's just so much available to you. The last nifty thing I'm going to tell you about before I descend into Wilkie Collins is this, the new Craftlet Tour is about to be announced. No, no, I know you've been waiting. <laughs> so have we. It took us a while to get everything arranged because anyone who knows who went on the Craftlet 2010 trip, Diane is no slouch and Diane is only going to release information when it is done, cooked, and ready to eat. And you are going to love this. So here's the news. This year, 2011, the Craftlet Tour starts in Boston. That's right. You knew it had to be coming, right? We get a Scarlet Letter tour in the fall, but this one's even better, even better than you might have dreamed in your best dreams because we do Boston, sure. We do Salem, sure. We see a little Thoreau, a little Emerson, a little Alcott, a little all these people who we've been reading and learning about for the last almost five years with each other, right? And it's going to be beautiful because there's going to be fall color, all the where you stay, all the travel, all the crazy, all of that taken care of for you. I will be playing the part of Peter, for those of you who went on last year's trip, I will be tour guiding for not the entire trip. Uh, we do have some some guides who are specific to areas, but for a lot, 
a lot of the trip, it will be me. And, um, <laughs> and this is really exciting. Any of you who have gone to Knit Camp or Sock Summit or, oh, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of other venues where you have had access to Schoolhouse Press and Meg Swanson and all things Zimmermanian, you probably know Amy Detchen. She is stunning. She is taller than me, which I love. And uh, honestly, she has a better laugh than me. And I like laughing. She likes laughing even more than I do. She was the most fun to sit down with at Sock Summit. And so getting the opportunity to travel with her and not just travel with her, but it's like, it's like getting an introduction to knitting camp. You know, you don't have to use your summertime. You don't have to go all the way up into the frozen north. You just get to sit on a bus and stay in hotels with me and Amy. We are so lucky to have her with us. And I'm over the moon. It's going to be very exciting. And uh, let's see, brochures, pricing, all of that will be online after January 21st, but it will also be at Vogue Knitting Live. You, if you find Amy, you will find the brochures and the information so you can grab it from her at Vogue Knitting Live if you're going to be there. Now, as for me, I will be at Stitches West with brochures and I will be with the fabulous Jenny the Potter. Uh, Jenny's mom, Lucinda, went on our last trip, so I don't know who we're going to be able to convince to go with us this time, but I'm hoping for a little Potter action, because if you haven't met Jenny the Potter, you've really missed out. She, her whole family, her husband, her daughter, her mom, they're just all fabulous people. So, Stitches West, Vogue Knitting Live, online at the Craftlet show notes after January 21st, because we're getting all the, you know, the artsy stuff together for you. And uh, reservations will open on January 24th. Okay, so I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Oh, wait, I haven't told you the best part. So Boston, sure. Bostonian Salem area, sure. And then we travel across Massachusetts. There's Sturbridge, there's Webbs, there's uh, sheep and alpaca farms. There's all this stuff going across the state. Stockbridge, if you've never been to Stockbridge in the Berkshires, hello, James Taylor. Mm, gorgeous, gorgeous, especially this time of year. And then, hmm, Stockbridge in October. That's That sounds strangely familiar and kind of oddly close to something in New York that happens the second week in October. I know. Why don't we end the tour at Rhinebeck? Right? So, um, there are options with the Rhinebeck thing because I know not everybody who's going to go is a knitter. That's fine. We love you anyway. But, uh, as before, fabulous literary fiber, artisty kind of trip. And again, as I've said, Craftlet people are the best people. Therefore, the, what is it, transitive property? People on the Craftlet trips are the best people. And this was absolutely, quite definitely, borne out and proved to be true on the Craftlet 2010 tour. So, I hope you can come I know for people in the States who couldn't get to the UK, this one will probably be easier for you, even though, you know, the East Coast is kind of far away. We will get trips going everywhere, trust me. We have many years to go on this. I'm not stopping anytime soon. People in the UK, I know it's going to be hard. I know it's going to be hard to get to the States, but if you can, you'll be able to see parts of the States that you simply wouldn't go to otherwise including Rhinebeck, right? So, spread the word, tell your friends, make your reservations starting January 24th. Uh, I think that's all the news on that. So, I have to look at my notes because I've been saving up notes for quite a while here. Oh, no, there was one last thing. Make a boob. No, really. Here's the thing. Here's the deal. Uh, one of our listeners emailed and said that uh, she would like me to 
tell you about this project and how you can contribute. This is a community art project about breast cancer by an award-winning quilt artist named Nina Lisa Moen from Norway. She and I have been emailing back and forth. She is collecting symbolic fabric boobs from all over the world, which will be decorated at workshops and made into make a boob art. This provides art therapy for breast cancer patients and raises awareness and involvement through the making of boobs for the project and the exhibition. Art pieces will be donated to hospitals and organizations who work with breast cancer and breast cancer patients. If you would like to contribute, you can make boobs and send them to Nina Lisa. You will find the step-by-step instructions, the mail, the address, and all that stuff on her blog. And I have a link to that blog, but it is make a boob all one word, dot blogspot.com. So, um, <laughs> it's just funny. Uh, she said she's hoping to turn this into a worldwide, an official worldwide project in 2012, but this first year it is being run by her from, uh, from Norway. So this is very exciting. She is an award-winning quilt artist who, and, and a listener. See, all those people, that's you. Uh, she's an award-winning quilt artist who designs patterns and teaches classes on the sides. She loves having creativity front and center in her life, and she likes to do other fiber arts like knitting, crocheting, needlework, just like so many of us. She hasn't been blogging for very long, but she obviously has been very present in the world professionally and creatively. And she is, when I talk about my fabulous math listeners who, you know, didn't do the book thing before, but they're enjoying books now as adults, she's one of our math people. Yay! And she said she always smiles when I talk about my fabulous math and science people on the podcast. So she is a second language learner, which is, you know, amazing because I can't think of a language that's more insane than English, at least as far as spelling rules go. And, um, she didn't get a lot of British and American lit history, so this is pretty cool for her. And uh, and she said, you know, some of the stuff is kind of hard to follow, especially when you get into colloquial stuff and things like that, but she always enjoys listening. So, knowing that, send her a boob. I will have information on what and where on the show notes at craftlit.com. Now... Wilkie Collins, right? This is the author of Woman in White. And uh, Collins is a fascinating guy. And not a surprise, right? Because when have we done like, oh, this author's really dull. Well, Collins, Collins is interesting. He's interesting for a lot of reasons. And I can't divulge all of the reasons why he's interesting because some of them actually have kind of very specific repercussions in the book the woman in white so uh you're just gonna have to trust me on this one that i will reveal all (laughs) as it becomes important um he not surprisingly uh, died rather young Um, He was only in his 60s, maybe 65. He was born in 1824 and died in 1889. Far too young. But he had had kind of, you know, the standard interesting childhood and stuff. And uh, interestingly, he and Dickens are um, colleagues. They they work together and uh, he wound up being published by... Uh, Dickens in Dickens' weekly publication all the year round, which is how uh, The Woman in White got out to the public, as well as, you know, a lot of Dickens stuff. I think Tale of Two Cities may, in fact, even have been the first publication in all the year round. I have to check on that. I read that a couple weeks ago, I think. But um, Wilkie Collins, interesting family, interesting circle of friends, all of that comes to play in the novel The Woman in White. Now, for those of you who don't know what The Woman in White is, or aren't one of the people who've been begging me for four years to do this on the podcast, Uh, The Woman in White was a groundbreaking novel at the time. It was the first sensationalist novel of its day, and uh, Collins really... All right, this sounds funny, but he wrote the book on how to write these books. 
uh, not only that, but the modern day detective novel, like, I mean, like Sherlock Holmes type detective novels, Collins did that with his next book, The Moonstone something mystery. That's, oh, The Moonstone Castle mystery is a, is a, it's a, Nancy Drew. No, it's just The Moonstone. The Moonstone was his, his book after this, and that was the one that was uh, really uh, set the rules for how one does mystery novels. So, Collins, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that he was a rule breaker as much as he was a rule maker. Now, one of the things that makes The Woman in White so unique even by today's standards, is that the sections, not the chapters, but the sections are written by different characters um, as though th they were, you know, handing, handing these documents over to a lawyer or an inquest board or something like that. And it's really not clear in the beginning. I mean, people refer to what they're doing in their sections, but it's not clear exactly who they're handing this documentation over to or why they are handing it over to, but you have a pretty good idea that something happened. And you'd be right, because stuff does happen. The other thing that Collins does, which my husband commented on, because, you know, as a playwright, he has wrestled with this, and in the course of writing my novel, I've wrestled with it too. It's very easy for every character in a book to sound just like you or every character in a play to sound just like you. Now, my husband is really like audaciously good at writing women. And so his female characters and his male characters never sound the same. They are always very different. And it's a gift. Wilkie Collins, not only accomplished the ability to write very solid male characters, but his women. And this is, you know, this is in 1860, what, 1860? 1865? When did he write this, this book? Yeah, it was published in 1859 to 1860. Okay, in 1860, he is doing in England, in Victorian England, what Hawthorne was doing in the States with Hester Prynne creating an amazing, strong uh, female character who is, I mean, sure, she's virtuous and all that stuff, but she is no wilting violet. She is tough and fabulous and read by Ruth Golding, who read Flatland. I know, right? I mean, how much better does it get? So, she, he's done all of that, but then all, along with that, as if that wasn't enough, he wrote an amazing, I don't want to say he's a villain, because he's not. He's absolutely ambiguous. I mean, we can have arguments, and I hope we do, back and forth over email and in the show notes about uh, this one character, because, you know, you'll start to think that you understand him and that he's a bad guy, and then the next time you go, oh, wait, well, mm, no, maybe not, and I... Ambiguity is the name of the day. But there is also one other character who is such a snot. He is just a horrid, horrid person. And the wonderful part about that, because usually you don't like people who are like that, is he's so appalling that you really, you have to laugh. At some point, you just kind of, you know, snort because he's just so awful. So we have lots of wonderful characters to really sink our teeth into with this. It's nothing like Connecticut Yankee, where, you know, your narrator was not only unreliable, but often unlikable. That is not the situation here. Some of our narrators are going to be a bit ponderous, but never... Mm, uninteresting. You know? It's great. It's great. It's a really great book. And uh, there are lots of film versions. There are three, four silent versions. Four! That just, I mean, that gives you some idea of how 
you know, how much this book impressed itself on people. Um, there's a, a 1940 film, Crimes in the Dark House, which is loosely based on all of this. Uh, 1948 Hollywood film adapted um, with Gig Young and Alexis Smith and Eleanor Parker and Sidney Greenstreet. I know. There was a 1982 BBC miniseries version with Diana Quick, who I know I've seen in stuff and I can't remember. Then there was a Soviet version, another BBC TV version in 1997. And was that it? I guess that's it. I think that's all of it. I thought there was another version in the 80s. Maybe not. Maybe not. Doesn't really matter. The important thing is we are about to read it. One of the things that I wanted to give you a heads up about is that this book has long chapters, which means that rarely will we be doing back-to-back chapters. Now, as I said, each chapter is not one per person. So some people's narratives are four, five, six chapters long. And that means, you know, it's going to be four, five, six episodes. Um, very occasionally will the the chapters come in short enough that I can back to back them. But there will be episodes where the chapter itself is an hour or an hour and 10. So I'll do everything I can to keep myself brief, but, you know, give you what you need and then uh, back out and just let you listen to the reader. Um, the other thing is a couple of the readers are, are not so good really. And I am employing other Craftlet listeners who I've contacted to see if they can do some readings for us. And I actually contacted Ruth Golding to see if she could make up for a couple of the uh, chapters that she wasn't able to read on on LibriVox. She was called in late and um, the other chapters really suffer without her. So if we can't get her to do the re-record, because she got, she's got actual paid gigs now she's that good uh if we can't get her to do it then I'll, I'll come up with something else but that won't be for a little bit anyway so i just want to give you a little bit more information on wilkie collins and then i'm going to let you go and i'll try and podcast a little bit earlier in the week next week um so i can get you the first the first chapters out um collins was interesting for a couple well for lots of reasons. And this is, I know, just scratching the surface. Um, he came from a respected family. His his father was a landscape artist who was part of the Royal Academy. Um, he uh, he was apprenticed to a, a, as a clerk uh, for a tea merchant. He was unhappy. He wrote his first novel while he was there. And then he eventually um, even considered a career painting. But didn't didn't wind up going that direction. In fact, the first book he wrote, um, Iolani, didn't get published until 1999, interestingly enough. However, in 1851, he was introduced to Charles Dickens, and that, as you might imagine, changed everything. They collaborated. Dickens was a mentor. Um, it even went so far as Wilkie Collins's younger brother winds up marrying one of Charles Dickens's daughters. I mean, it's, you know, they're very wrapped together in literary history. Now, Collins was ill, um, not, you know, it wasn't like he had tuberculosis or anything. He, he had uh, gout or rheumatoid arthritis, some, something, you know, it's hard to know what they were calling it back then. Either way, he was in a lot of pain and he was taking laudanum, which is, you know, an opiate, which is <laughs> not good. Um, he became paranoid. He even refers to opium use and abuse in uh, in the book The Moonstone. So, you know, this, uh, not unlike what happened with Coleridge, this was a problem. Now, here's an interesting thing. This is from a guy who wrote, uh, traditionally wrote, strong, kicking women. He never married but he did live with a widow and her daughter for years and had three children with another woman. <laughs> and um, eventually the widow went to marry somebody and then came back to him and he continued having relationships with both of these women until he died. 
<laughs> okay. I mean, that was hugely scandalous. So it shouldn't be a surprise, I think, that often in his writing, you see him as Dickens was, critical of some of the mores of the time. He was particularly upset about the plight of illegitimate children in England. And we know from Flatland uh, and from uh, Edwin Abbott Abbott's satire of Victorian England, we know uh, something of what happened with Oliver, you know, all, all of Dickens' writing. Um, we know that life was challenging at best for someone of... Uh, parents who were not married to each other. So, Collins had an issue. <laughs> and yes, I did, I double checked, and The Woman in White did come out in All the Year Round right after A Tale of Two Cities did. And uh, he was, Collins was successful because it followed Tale of Two Cities, but the magazine was successful because The Woman in White was the book that followed Tale of Two Cities. So that was kind of cool. Um, he, he, he had a really good 10 years. And then, you know, the laudanum kind of kicked in and he, he kind of lost it. Not that, not that his later books weren't good, just that they weren't as powerful, you know, as The Woman in White and the Moonstone. Um, so, Collins, there's a couple of things to listen for in Collins. One is his... Uh, awareness of the treatment of women, which I think goes way beyond what a lot of female writers were writing about at the time. Um, and he's he's quite clear that he he does not like the way they are treated. And yet he has characters. You know, this is where you can't tell whose voice it is that you're listening to. You know, is it the author or has he created a character to be this face of society? There are characters who are absolutely in line with the mores of the time and the expectations that are set on them, both men and women, uh, the restrictions that are placed on them, and he's perfectly fine with that. And then there are other characters who seem to be the voice of this kind of defiant spirit that he carries for both himself and for women and the struggles that they were dealing with at the time. So, you have that happening. You also have... Uh, a number of major events in the book, and some of them eerier than others, uh, being based in truth, fact, things that actually happened to Mr. Collins. So there's, um, you know, some people talk about The Women in White being a very mysterious book, and the fascinating thing is that a lot of the mystery was actually real. So that's kind of cool. You also have uh, this epistolary nature of the novel. Normally, I think an epistolary novel is when people are writing stories back and forth together, like um, the Enchanted Chocolate Pot, uh, which is a recent version of that kind of epistolary novel. That's one way to do it. His is, uh, as I said before, a series of testimonies that are written down and being presented to us, the readers. So, Collins, Collins is just a fascinating character, it, it, you know, in his own right. And I'm going to be filling in more gaps as we go along because, there, like I said, there are lots of interesting things that directly relate between Collins's life and the book. And I don't want to give away any more than I already have because you already know a lot about the characters that you're about to be introduced to and a lot about... Uh, Collins himself, and when and where he was when he was writing. And I hope that you are ex as excited about this book as I am. I had a ball listening to this sucker and just thinking about all the really amazing parts about this book that are so not of his time, you know? But that's, I mean, that's the whole gig with the Craftlet thing, right? It's these are the books that we wouldn't read if somebody wasn't plugging them in your ear. And yet, great books, right? I mean, I know some of you would argue with me about a few of them, which is fine. I can handle it. No, really. <laughs> anyway, 
Today was just getting you all the information from listeners sending stuff in and information on Wilkie Collins. Next week, hopefully, I'm hoping early next week, I will have chapter one of The Women in White out and into your ears as soon as possible. I want to do it before the teaching thing starts because that's dramatic for me. The whole idea of having to grade papers again. Many of you understand my my pain. I'm, I'm, I'm actually kind of hoping that this is the last time I ever have to do it. That I, I really hope I don't have to teach in Virginia. <sighs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. Just, you know, it's, it's the paper grading. Really, honestly. You know. You know exactly what I mean. So, there it is. Anyway... I really hope you had a wonderful Christmas season, a wonderful New Year's. I hope you didn't die on a road. Oh my gosh, I totally forgot to tell you about how I almost died on a road. Okay, I'm just going to put a link in the show notes and you have to go read the story with pictures at um, Mama Onits because <laughs> we almost didn't get home. And seriously, it's been, let's see, it's the sixth today and I still don't feel like myself. I'm still oversleeping because my body is still recovering. That's how scary it was. 9-11, my husband made this point. I thought this was interesting. 9-11, I wasn't in control. I knew I wasn't in control. Therefore, I wasn't really responsible for saving all those kids. All I was doing was my best. All you can do is your best. You get the kids out that you can get kids out with, and you do the best you can, keeping everybody safe and together and alive. And... Nobody's going to look at you cross-eyed if things go to pot. I mean, there's only so much anyone can do in a situation like that. You know, you're, mostly it comes down to luck. When you're the one driving on the icy road and your children are in the back and your husband is next to you and he doesn't listen to the show, but I will tell you right now, since he's not listening and he won't listen, I'm a better driver. I, I won't say it in front of him, and I won't ask him to validate that, but I will tell you, he didn't complain or even raise his eyebrows when I took the keys. I've been driving since I was nine. That's how long I've been driving. I was 5'2 when I was nine, so there was no reason not to when you're in the desert and there's nothing to hit but dirt. So, uh, yeah, it was ugly, it was scary, and... I was 100% responsible for my family, and it was terrifying. I don't even think my blog post comes close, but at least you can get an idea of what happened to us. So I hope your, your New Year's was better than that. <laughs> All right, with that, I will let you go. You have a great start to your new year. Go listen to the new podcasts, Clothed in the Lamb and Craft Patients. Go make a boob. Go knit a garter stitch square. Go save the world because Lord knows it needs some saving right about now. And, um, and I hope the year 2011 is good for all of us. And I will give you more updates on when and where you can get a hold of a copy of What Would Madame Defarge Knit. It will be available to you through Cooperative Press, this much I know. And if you go and you bug your local yarn store, I am fairly certain your local yarn store can get it through one of their distributors. And I will have that information for you as well on the next podcast. Because the more of you who ask for the book, the more of the books will be available to everyone. Please remember to support the people who support Craftlit. Visit Knitting Out Loud, Listen While You Knit, and Knit Circus Online Magazine, offering three rings of knitting, sewing, and fun. You can check out the winter issue at www.knitcircus.com. And Scribe Tutor, the online writing tutor offering personalized and convenient writing help for all ages. You can find more about Scribe Tutor at scribetutor.com. And please visit the blogs and sites of Craftlet supporters. Those links can be found in the sidebar of the show notes. The show notes can be found at craftlit.com. Craftlit can also be accessed by its own iPhone application. 
You can purchase it at the iPhone or iTouch application store, or you can subscribe free at iTunes. Craftlet is made possible by the generous support of its listeners, and for that, I am truly grateful. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. Welcome to Craftlet. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from my corner of the Sonoran Desert, the Old Pueblo, Tucson, Arizona. Episode 193 of Memorials and Mortality. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by Knitting Out Loud. Listen while you knit. You can find out more about the full catalog at knittingoutloud.com. Also, Knit Circus Magazine, featuring three rings of knitting, sewing, and fun. You can find out more at www.knitcircus.com. And this year, holiday vacations and Knit Circus and Craftlet take you to... Massachusetts. That's right, this fall color tour will take place in October 2011. We will be traveling all around the greater Massachusetts area, starting with nights, many nights in Boston, and traveling across Massachusetts, stopping at all sorts of fantabulous places, including News Flash. We will be stopping at at, are you ready? Kristen Nicholas's farm. Yes, we are going to be having the best time. I should have a button up on the show notes shortly that will link you to a brochure and you can find all that you need to know in the brochure or by contacting me or Diane at Holiday Vacations. There will be a link to Diane's email address in the show notes as well. And, uh, and if you're on Ravelry, there will be all sorts of information on, uh, on Ravelry, too. You can join the Craftlit group, and Diane will get you hooked up with everything you need to know. Well, a lot of you already know uh, some red show notes, some red Twitter posts. Um, I, I had planned to have the previous episode out considerably earlier than I did, but we had uh, a bit of a kerfuffle here in Tucson, Arizona, and um, it's been very, very sad because not only did did six people lose their lives in uh, in a, a fit of uh, violence that Tucson really hasn't seen the likes of before, um, which is pretty impressive when you consider how many people here are armed uh, and carry concealed weapons with without a license. So not, not only did, did six people lose their lives, but there are many, many more people who are still struggling in the hospital. And of course, our representative, Gabrielle Giffords, who is nothing if not a moderate, kind, generous woman, just in general, who has a wonderful husband who my, my son has met because my son went to a bunch of different things out at the uh, Pima County Air and Space Museum. So uh, it's, been, it's been a little traumatic um, just in the kind of the grand psychic scheme of things, but it hit a little bit closer to home because Christina Taylor Green, the nine-year-old girl who was killed, Christina was on my son's little league team, the the Pirates, and I'm sure you've heard, uh, whether it was from President Obama or or on some of the other media outlets, you've probably heard lots and lots about Christina Taylor Green, and I know it's always. Um, you know, tempting in situations like this to only say the best things about the recently departed. And I would just like to put out there that with Christina, there simply wasn't anything else to say except for wonderful things about her. She was charming. She was funny. She was fierce. She is such a good competitor. And, um, and you know how 
sports guys, coaches, you know, they like to talk about, you know, dedication and courage and determination. And, you know, they use these words to talk about how uh, we should comport ourselves in life and particularly when, when playing sports. And that's all fine and well, but uh, Christina really did embody all of the best that any of us could ever hope to be. And um, I just, I'm still stunned. I got home from her funeral today. The Westboro Church people were supposed to come and uh, picket and scream at everyone. And so the Hells Angels showed up. So the street was lined for like a mile either direction from the church by Hells Angels and other bikers too. And their bikes were blocking the way to make sure that the family would be unmolested by crazy screaming people. So uh, I don't even know if they showed up because I, I, I got inside, which was honestly miraculous in and of itself. The, the place was packed, but um, the baseball team was there. My son decided um, not to go at the last minute. He, 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 done a few other events and and I think he was it was hard for him um as it is for any any kid to to lose another kid especially in in such a horrible violent way so it's been uh it's been a week the last couple days but uh but there there it is and you know it's not not to push a bad segue but the the tone um, the mood, not the tone, the, the mood uh, in Tucson. You probably couldn't have told if you watched Obama's speech because it seemed more like a pep rally, but, but truly the place has been weeping for days. And I, I think they really felt the need to celebrate the lives that were lost, as well as celebrate the people who are still fighting to uh, get their health back and uh, and and kind of you know celebrate the fact that we're we're fighting to get back to maybe not even normal but maybe a new normal a better normal where people speak more nicely to each other i don't know you know i posted on my mama onit's blog that i've never heard any human <laughs> um ever speak the way that the crazy screaming people on tv and i'm not picking political sides i mean there are crazy screaming people everywhere you know from left to right swing the pendulum whatever way you want you can find crazy screaming people i've never met a human who talks like that in fact i don't know that i've known anyone right left or center who gets that riled up about any subject unless they're quoting one of the crazy screaming people so so part of my blog post was that perhaps perhaps now is as good a time as any for us, the sane people, the mothers and fathers who are working to raise their children and, and the young people who are going to be inheriting this crazy world of ours. And, and for everyone just to say, you know, let's be classy, shall we? If you can't say something nice, just don't say anything. Because, I mean, we all learned this when we were in kindergarten, right? I mean, this is not news. So, you know... Let's class up our act a little bit. And gosh darn it, it should be craftlet people who start this brigade. <laughs> because you are the best people, as I have said over and over again. And, and you are classy. I mean, go back to the discussions we had about Marmy and the book Little Women. And, you know, maybe it's unattainable, but gosh, that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. You know, God knows I've stuck my foot down my throat 17 different times a day for, you know, ever. But not, not because I'm trying to hurt people or score points or anything. Any, I don't know. I don't know. It's just been very, very sad here. And, um, and I hope it does make people stop and think, you know, because Christina was a class act and, uh, and was destined for greatness. I absolutely agree with her father. She would have just set the world on fire. So I will try and live my life better so that um, she'd be proud of me. I think it's a worthy goal. Along with that, I would like to send out a huge thank you 
to all of the people who have already emailed offering to take my husband out to dinner while he is living all by his lonesome in Virginia for a couple of months. Uh, people who have introduced me to other people in the Virginia area. Um, it's just been a spectacular. I, I constantly am saying to my husband, oh my gosh, my listeners are the best people. And it's so true. And, and in that vein, if you know anyone who wants to buy a house in Tucson, Arizona, <laughs> The moving part will be easy. The going to Virginia part will be easy. <laughs> the selling the house part is going to be painful. We're we're underwater. Not not because uh, not because we were reckless and not because we bought out of our means. We were perfectly able to make our mortgage payments and still are. That would be not a problem. But uh, when you have to move, when your house is like being appraised at you know way 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 below what you paid for it and just because the market tanked not because anything else went wrong it's an enormous chunk of change right and uh we're looking at what our options are and the answer is not many so it's gonna be ugly for a while but i'm trying not to think about that right now because really there is only so much the human brain can take as evidenced by the first chapters of a woman in white. How was that for a segue, right? Ha! I, I'm pretty proud of myself with that one. So, The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. I know so many of you are so excited about the fact that we're doing this book finally, because it took me so long. And, uh, and I'm so glad you guys voted for it. I'm, I'm very happy that now on the Craftlet show notes, I can do uh, little polls because it, it does make it easier along with the woman in white poll by the way i forgot to mention this last time there will be no more video podcasts we have learned <laughs> via dickens we have learned our lesson and uh yeah that didn't work so well it gummed up a lot of settings it made uh the ipod and the Android Android application go, go slow and kind of glitchy, and it's just it's over. We aren't we aren't doing that anymore. Uh, so you're safe and free. I know for some of you it was really nice to be able to have the chapter markers, but the problems that it created far outweighed the niftiness of the the chapter markers. So sorry about that. Someday technology will improve. And I will be able to do this for everyone. But in the meantime, um, we are sticking with just audio. And, and we are sticking with Woman in White. Wilkie Collins gave you an introduction to him last week. And I, I warned you that there were things about him and about his life that I simply didn't want to talk about yet. Because I would blow some surprise elements of the plot. So... I'll keep dropping new information about Wilkie Collins in in a more appropriate timeline for the book. So we're not done with Mr. Collins. There is more to that man than you've already learned. Alrighty, so this book is an epistolary novel, which means that it is a series of letters. That being said, it is not a series of letters like you are expecting. It is not... Um, Le Lier saint where it's, you know, one person, or, or Sorcery in um, the, what is it, Sorcery in Cecilia, the Enchanted Chocolate Pot, uh, where, or the Mason-Dixon Knitting Blog, you know, where Anne writes to Kay and Kay writes to Anne. This is a series of letters. They are all addressed to and addressing the same person and topic. Um, and because of this, uh, this book is groundbreaking. It's written in 18, or published in 1860, and it, it, it created conventions that we all take for granted. Like, if you have made it this far in your life and have never watched an episode of Law and Order, <laughs> this may come as news to you, but we've gotten used to uh, crime dramas that present the facts of the case from different points of view. That started here. It starts with Wilkie Collins. In fact, his book, The Moonstone, was the precursor for Sherlock Holmes. I think I touched on this last week. So we've got, we've got Wilkie Collins doing some pretty nifty things and some pretty groundbreaking things. He also breaks ground 
in some of his characterization. Now, the first character, the first character that we get to know is Walter Hartwright. And he is not going to break any rules. You are not going to look at this guy and go, wow, that's a really amazingly creative and unique character. I never expected to find anyone like that in the book from the Victorian era. You are going to say yawn is what you're going to say. That's fine, actually. You kind of need him to be a yawn, trust me, because you need to have at least one or two narrators in this epistolary format that you can go to and trust. And if Walter Hartwright were a raving lunatic or, you know, somebody who's like, oh my gosh, the world is falling apart, everything is drama, you wouldn't trust him to tell you the story. So put up with Walter Hartwright for a moment, if you don't mind. It'll it'll make It'll make a lot more sense in a couple of episodes. Now, the, the other thing about Wilkie Collins that I have grown to adore is, unlike Mark Twain, where you kind of have to figure out over time whether you can trust your narrator or a character or not, Wilkie Collins does a genius job of making it very clear very quickly there's no beating around the bush. You know when somebody is talking to you and you can believe every word they say, and you know when someone is selling you a bill of goods or trying to make themselves look better or trying to make their actions look more noble than they were. You're going to get lots of that throughout this book. And uh, one of the really nifty things about this particular LibriVox recording is that the different uh, authors of the letters that are going into the public record of this case they're read by different people. Sometimes that's good. <laughs> Josie at Crafty Pot is going to do some recording for us because there are a couple of readers that really I won't subject you to. I may have to find a replacement for Ruth Golding, who read Flatland. I've corresponded with her. She said she got lovely emails from some of you, by the way, lovely blog posts and, and notes and things telling her what a great job she did with Flatland. So yay, you pat yourselves on the back. You made her very happy. And um, she does a, a brilliant job of reading a very important character, but there are, I think, three episodes where she didn't do the reading and it suffers by comparison. So I'm going to do my best to do what I can to make it all work out. Uh, I'm about to play the audio. There's very little in this opening expositionary section that will be confusing to you. There are, however, some interesting things to note. One, Walter Hartwright is an artist. He's making his living as an artist. And Wilkie Collins's father did. So Wilkie Collins actually saw someone living the life that Walter Hartwright uh, lives. And in fact, his brother, kind of emotionally, was the model for Hartwright. So he's not making this one up out of whole cloth. This is based on something he knows. So that's, that's one. Two, parts of this first section are based on things that actually happened to Wilkie Collins. I will not divulge which ones until later. Three, Wilkie Collins will pull out all the stops in creating a story that you will feel compelled to continue with, even though the beginning is slow. He uses foreshadowing. He uses uh, metaphor. He uses a little bit of hyperbole. He also does some really interesting things with characterization. Listen to how Hartwright describes his sister and mother. I found it very curious. I was kind of surprised. Remember, this is 1860. This is kind of the height of Dickensian England. This is when Tale of Two Cities was written. So it's, uh, the Victorian thing is kind of big right now. And yeah, you know, just listen to these two women because you're going to get some, some other women later who you can compare to his sister and his mother. There's also going to be an Italian gentleman. Now, some of you will feel that he is unfairly characterized and being made fun of. I beg you not to judge so quickly. Like any good writer who is writing a narrator's voice, 
that is not their own, you learn more about Walter Hartwright, the character, than you are learning about Wilkie Collins, the man, when you listen to the description of Walter Hartwright's Italian friend. It will read like a caricature. It will read like it's uh, taking easy shots at uh, someone who's emigrated to the UK back in, in Victorian times. Just remember place and time, and also remember narrator does not equal author. Okay? I think that's pretty much all I need to give you a heads up about before we head into the audio. This is another, this is one of the long ones. This is, I think, 50 some odd minutes of audio. So this is going to run over an hour. And um, I think that's it. The book is split into epics or epochs. And uh, we obviously start with epoch the first. And uh, I think that's it. I am going to let you hear some of the introductory audio so that you know who's reading what, because as I said, there are many readers from this one, and uh, I'd like to give them a heads up. So, without any further yammer, here is the beginning of Wilkie Collins, The Woman in White. Read by Tim Bulkley of BigBible.org The First Epoch The story begun by Walter Hartwright of Clement's Inn teacher of drawing. This is the story of what a woman's patience can endure, and what a man's resolution can achieve. If the machinery of the law could be depended on to fathom every case of suspicion, and to conduct every process of inquiry with moderate assistance only from the lubricating influences of oil of gold, the events which fill these pages might have claimed their share of the public attention in a court of justice. But the law is still, in certain inevitable cases, the pre-engaged servant of the long purse, and the story is left to be told, for the first time in this place. As the judge might once have heard it, so the reader shall hear it now. No circumstance of importance from the beginning to the end of the disclosure shall be related on hearsay evidence. When the writer of these introductory lines, Walter Hartwright by name, happens to be more closely connected than others with the incidents to be recorded, he will describe them in his own person. When his experience fails, he will retire from the position of narrator, and his task will be continued from the point at which he has left it off, by other persons who can speak to the circumstances under notice from their own knowledge, just as clearly and positively as he has spoken before them. Thus the story here presented will be told by more than one pen as the story of an offence against the laws is told in court by more than one witness, with the same object in both cases to present the truth always in its most direct and most intelligible aspect, and to trace the course of one complete series of events by making the persons who have been most closely connected with them at each successive stage relate their own experience word for word. Let Walter Hartwright, teacher of drawing, aged twenty-eight years, be heard first. It was the last day of July. The long, hot summer was drawing to a close, and we, the weary pilgrims of the London pavement, were beginning to think of the cloud shadows on the cornfields and the autumn breezes on the seashore. For my own poor part, the fading summer left me out of health, out of spirits, and, if the truth must be told, out of money as well. During the past year I had not managed my professional resources as carefully as usual, and my extravagance now limited me to the prospect of spending the autumn economically between my mother's cottage at Hampstead and my own chambers in town. The evening, I remember, was still and cloudy. The London air was at its heaviest. The distant hum of the street traffic was at its faintest. The small pulse of life within me and the great heart of the city around me seemed to be sinking in unison, languidly and more languidly with the sinking sun. I roused myself from the book which I was dreaming over, rather than reading, and left my chambers to meet the cool night air in the suburbs. It was one of the two evenings in every week which I was accustomed to spend with my mother and my sister. So I turned my steps northward in the direction of Hampstead. Events which I have yet to relate make it necessary to mention in this place that my father had been dead for some years at the period of which I am now writing and that my sister Sarah and I were the sole survivors of a family of five children. My father was a drawing-master before me. His exertions had made him highly successful in his profession, 
and his affectionate anxiety to provide for the future of those who were dependent on his labours, had impelled him from the time of his marriage to devote to the ensuring of his life a much larger portion of his income than most men consider it necessary to set aside for that purpose. Thanks to his admirable prudence and self-denial, my mother and sister were left after his death as independent of the world as they had been during his lifetime. I succeeded to his connection, and had every reason to feel grateful for the prospect that awaited me at my starting in life. The quiet twilight was still trembling on the topmost ridges of the heath, and the view of London below me had sunk into a black gulf in the shadow of the cloudy night, when I stood before the gate of my mother's cottage. I had hardly rung the bell before the house-door was opened violently. My worthy Italian friend, Professor Peschka, appeared in the servant's place, and darted out joyously to receive me, with a shrill foreign parody of an English cheer. On his own account, and I must be allowed to add on mine also, the professor merits the honour of a formal introduction. Accident has made him the starting point of the strange family story which it is the purpose of these pages to unfold. I had first become acquainted with my Italian friend by meeting him at certain great houses where he taught his own language, and I taught drawing. All I then knew of the history of his life was he had once held a position in the University of Padua, that he had left Italy for political reasons, the nature of which he uniformly declined to mention to anyone, and that he had been for many years respectably established as a teacher of languages. Without being actually a dwarf, for he was perfectly well proportioned from head to foot, Peshka was, I think, the smallest human being I ever saw out of a showroom. Remarkable anywhere by his personal appearance, he was still further distinguished among the rank and file of mankind by the harmless eccentricity of his character. The ruling idea of his life appeared to be that he was bound to show his gratitude to the country which had afforded him an asylum and a means of subsistence by doing his utmost to turn himself into an Englishman. Not content with paying the nation in general the compliment of invariably carrying an umbrella, and invariably wearing gaiters and a white hat, the professor further aspired to become an Englishman in his habits and amusements, as well as in his personal appearance. Finding us distinguished as a nation by our love of athletic exercises, the little man, in the innocence of his heart, devoted himself impromptu to all our English sports and pastimes whenever he had the opportunity of joining them firmly persuaded that he could adopt our national amusements of the field by an effort of will, precisely as he had adopted our national gaiters and our national white hat. I had seen him risk his limbs blindly at a fox-hunt, and in a cricket-field, and soon afterwards I saw him risk his life just as blindly in the sea at Brighton. We had met there accidentally, and were bathing together. If we had been engaged in any exercise particular to my own nation, I should, of course, have looked after Peshka carefully. But as foreigners are generally quite as well able to take care of themselves in the water as Englishmen, it never occurred to me that the art of swimming might merely add one more to the list of manly exercises which the professor believed that he could learn impromptu. Soon after we had both struck out from the shore, I stopped, finding my friend did not gain on me, and turned around to look for him. To my horror and amazement, I saw nothing between me and the beach but two little white arms which struggled for an instant above the surface of the water, and then disappeared from view. When I dived for him, the poor little man was lying quietly coiled up at the bottom, in a hollow of shingle, looking by many degrees smaller than I'd ever seen him look before. During the few minutes that elapsed while I was taking him in, the air revived him, and he ascended the steps of the machine with my assistance. With the partial recovery of his animation came the return of his wonderful delusion on the subject of swimming. As soon as his chattering teeth would let him speak, he smiled vacantly, and said he thought it must have been the cramp. When he thoroughly recovered himself, and had joined me on the beach, his warm southern nature broke through all artificial English restraints in a moment. He overwhelmed me with the, with the wildest expressions of affection, exclaimed passionately in his exaggerated Italian way that he would hold his life henceforth at my disposal, and declared that he should never be happy again until he had found an opportunity of proving his gratitude by rendering me some service which I might remember on my side to the end of my days. 
I did my best to stop the torrent of his tears and protestations, by persisting in treating the whole adventure as a good subject for a joke, and succeeded at last, as I imagined, in lessening Pesca's overwhelming sense of obligation to me. Little did I think then, little did I think afterwards, when our pleasant holiday had drawn to an end, that the opportunity of serving me, for which my grateful companion so ardently longed, was soon to come. That he was eagerly to seize it on an instant, and that by doing so he was to turn the whole current of my existence into a new channel, and to alter me to myself almost past recognition. Yet so it was, for if I had not dived for Professor Pesca when he lay under the water of his, on his shingle bed, I should in all human probability never have been connected with the story which these pages will relate. I should never, perhaps, have heard even the name of the woman who has lived in all my thoughts, who has possessed herself of all my energies, who has become the one guiding influence that now directs the purpose of my life. Pesca's face and manner on the evening when we confronted each other at my mother's gate were more than sufficient to inform me that something extraordinary had happened. It was quite useless, however, to ask him for an immediate explanation. I could only conjecture, while he was dragging me in with by both hands, that, knowing my habits, he had come to the cottage to make sure of meeting me that night, and that he had some news to tell me of an unusually agreeable kind. We both bounced into the parlour in a highly abrupt and undignified manner. My mother sat by the open window, laughing and fanning herself. Pesca was one of her especial favourites, and his wildest eccentricities were always pardonable in her eyes. Poor dear soul! From the first moment when she found out that the little professor was deeply and gratefully attached to her son, she opened her heart to him unreservedly and took all his puzzling foreign peculiarities for granted, without so much as attempting to understand any one of them. My sister Sarah, with all the advantages of youth, was, strangely enough, less pliable. She did full justice to Pesca's excellent qualities of heart, but she could not accept him implicitly, as my mother accepted him, for my sake. Her insular notions of propriety rose in perpetual revolt, against Pesca's constitutional contempt for appearances, and she was always more or less undisguisedly astonished at her mother's familiarity with the eccentric little foreigner. I have observed, not only in my sister's case, but in the instances of others, that we of the young generation are nothing like so hearty and so impulsive as some of our elders. I consistently see old people flushed and excited by the prospect of some anticipated pleasure which altogether fails to ruffle the tranquillity of their serene grandchildren. Are we, I wonder, quite such genuine boys and girls now as our seniors were in their time? Has the great advance in education taken rather too long a stride? And are we in these modern days just the least trifle in the world too well brought up? Without attempting to answer these questions decisively, I may at least record that I never saw my mother and my sister together in Pesca's society without finding my mother much the younger woman of the two. On this occasion, for example, while the old lady was laughing heartily over the boyish manner in which we had tumbled into the parlour, Sarah was perturbedly picking up the broken pieces of a teacup which the professor had knocked off the table in his precipitate advance to meet me at the door. "'I don't know what would have happened, Walter,' said my mother, "'if you delayed much longer.' Pesca had been half mad with impatience, and I have been half mad with curiosity. The professor has brought some wonderful news with him, in which he says you are concerned, and he has cruelly refused to give us the smallest hint of it till his friend Walter appeared. Very provoking. It spoils the set, murmured Sarah to herself, mournfully absorbed over the ruins of the broken cup. While these words were being spoken, Pesca happily and fussily unconscious of the irreparable wrong which the crockery had suffered at his hands, was dragging a large armchair to the opposite end of the room, so as to command us all three, in the character of a public speaker addressing an audience. Having turned the chair with its back towards us, he jumped into it on his knees, and excitedly addressed his small congregation of three, from an impromptu pulpit. "'Now, my good dears,' began Pesca, who always said good dears when he meant worthy friends, "'listen to me.' The time has come. I recite my good news. I speak at last. 
Hear, hear, said my mother, humouring the joke. The next thing he'll break, Mamma, whispered Sarah, will be the back of the best armchair. I go back into my life, and I address myself to the noblest of created beings, continued Pesca, vehemently apostrophizing my unworthy self over the top rail of the chair, who found me dead at the bottom of the sea, through cramp, and who pulled me to the top. And what did I say when I got into my own life and my own clothes again? Much more than was at all necessary, I answered as doggedly as possible, for the least encouragement in connection with this subject invariably let loose the professor's emotions in a flood of tears. I said, persisted the pesca, that my life belonged to my dear friend Walter for the rest of my days, and so it does. I said that I should never be happy again until I found the opportunity for doing a good something for Walter, and I have never been contented with myself until this most blessed day. Now, cried the enthusiastic little man at the top of his voice, the overflowing happiness bursts out of me at every pore of my skin like perspiration, for on my faith, my soul, and my honour, the something is done at last, and the only word to say now is right, all right. It may be necessary to explain here that Pesca prided himself on being a perfect Englishman in his language, as well as in his dress, manners, and amusements. Having picked up a few of our most familiar colloquial expressions, he scattered them about over his conversation whenever they happened to occur to him, turning them in his high relish for their sound and his general ignorance of their sense into compound words and repetitions of his own, and always running them into each other as if they consisted of one long syllable. Among the fine London houses where I teach the language of my native country, said the professor, rushing into his long-deferred explanation without another word of preface, there is one mighty fine in the big place called Portland. You all know where that is. Yes, yes, of course, of course. My fine house, my good dears, has got inside it a fine family, a mamma, fair and fat, three young misses, fair and fat, two young misters, fair and fat, and a papa, the fairest and the fattest of all, who is a mighty merchant, up to his eyes in gold, a fine man once, but seeing that he has got a naked head and two chins, fine no longer at the present time. Now, mind, I teach the sublime Dante to the young missus, and, ah, my soul, bless my soul, it, it is not in human language to say how the sublime Dante puzzles the pretty heads of all three, no matter, all in good time, and the more lessons the better for me. Now, mind, Imagine yourselves that I am teaching the young misses today as usual. We are all four of us down together in the hell of Dante at the seventh circle. But no matter for what, all the circles are alike to the three young misses, fair and fat. At the seventh circle, nevertheless, my pupils are sticking fast, and I, to set them going again, recite, explain, and blow myself up red-hot with useless enthusiasm when— a creak of boots in the passage outside, and in comes the golden papa, the mighty merchant, with the naked head and the two chins. Ha, ah, my good dears, I am closer than you think, for to the business now. Have you been patient so far, or have you said to yourselves, Deuce what the deuce, Pesca is long-winded to-night? We declared that we were deeply interested. The professor went on. In his hand the golden papa has a letter— and after he's made his excuse for disturbing us in our infernal region with the common mortal business of the house, he addresses himself to the three young misses and begins, as you English begin everything in this blessed world that you have to say, with a great O. Oh. oh, my dears, says the mighty merchant, I have got here a letter from my friend Mr. The name slipped out of my mind, but no matter, we shall come back to that. Yes, yes, all right, all right. So the papa says, I have got a letter from my friend the mister, and he wants a recommend from me, of a drawing-master, to go down to his house in the country. My soul bless my soul! When I heard the golden papa say those words, if I had been big enough to reach up to him, I should have put my arms round his neck, and pressed him to my bosom in a long and grateful hug. As it was, I only bounced upon my chair. My seat was on thorns, and my soul was on fire, to speak but I held my tongue, and let Papa go on. Perhaps you know, says this good man of money, twiddling his friend's letter this way and that, 
in his golden fingers and thumbs, "'perhaps you know, my dears, of a drawing-master that I can recommend.' The three young misses all look at each other, and then say, with the indispensable great O to begin, "'Oh, dear, no, Papa! But here is Mr. Pesca. At the mention of myself, I can hold no longer the thought of you, my good dears, mounts like blood to my head. I start from my seat, as if a spike had grown up from the ground through the bottom of my chair. I address myself to the mighty merchant, and I say, English phrase, "'Dear sir, I have the man, the first and foremost drawing-master of the world. Recommend him by the post to-night, and send him off bag and baggage.' English phrase again, "'Ha! Send him off bag and baggage by the train to-morrow.' "'Stop, stop,' says Papa. "'Is he a foreigner or an Englishman?' "'Englishman to the bone of his back,' I answer. "'Respectable?' says Papa. "'Sir,' I say, for this last question of his outrages me, and I have done being familiar with him. "'Sir, the immortal fire of genius burns in this Englishman's bosom, and what is more his father had it before him.' "'Never mind,' says the golden barbarian of a Papa. "'Never mind about his genius, Mr. Pesca. We don't want genius in this country unless it's accompanied by respectability.' and then we are very glad to have it, very glad indeed. Can your friend produce testimonials, letters that speak to his character? I wave my hand negligently. Letters, I say. Ha! My soul, bless my soul, I should think so indeed. Volumes of letters and portfolios of testimonials, if you like. One or two will do, says this man of phlegm and money. Let him send them to me with his name and address. And stop, stop, Mr. Pesca, before you go to your friend, you had better take a note. Banknote? I say indignantly. No banknote, if you please, till my brave Englishman has earned it first. Banknote? says Papa in great surprise. Who talked of banknote? I mean a note of the terms, a memorandum of what he is expected to do. Go on with your lesson, Mr. Pesca, and I will give you the necessary extract from my friend's letter. Down sits the mer man of merchandise and money, to his pen, ink, and paper, and down I go once again into the hell of Dante, with the three young misses after me. In ten minutes' time the note is written. The boots of Papa are creaking themselves away in the passage outside. From that moment, on my faith and soul and honour, I know nothing more. The glorious thought that I have caught my opportunity at last, and that my grateful service for my dearest friend in the world is as good as done already, flies up into my head and makes me drunk. How I pull my young missus and myself out of the infernal region again, and how my other business is done afterwards, how my little bit of dinner slides itself down my throat, I know no more than a man in the moon. Enough for me that here I am, with the mighty merchant's note in my hand, as large as life, as hot as fire, and as happy as a king. Ha, ha, ha! Right, right, all right! Here the professor waved the memorandum of terms above his head, and ended his long and voluble narrative with his shrill Italian parody of an English cheer. My mother rose the moment he had done, with flushed cheeks and brightened eyes. She caught the little man warmly by both hands. "'My dear good Pesca,' she said, "'I never doubted your true affection for Walter, but I am more than ever persuaded of it now.' "'I am sure we are very much obliged to Professor Pesca for Walter's sake,' added Sarah. She half rose while she spoke, as if to approach the armchair in her turn. But observing that Pesca was rapturously kissing my mother's hands, looked serious and resumed her seat. "'If the familiar little man treats my mother that way, how will he treat me?' Faces sometimes tell truth. And that was unquestionably the thought in Sarah's mind— as she sat down again. Although I myself was gratefully sensible of the kindness of Pesca's motives, my spirits were hardly so much elevated as they ought to have been by the prospect of future employment now placed before me. When the professor had quite done with my mother's hand, and when I had warmly thanked him for his interference on my behalf, I asked to be allowed to look at the note of terms which his respectable patron had drawn up for my inspection. Pesca handed me the paper with a triumphant flourish of the hand. "'Read!' said the little man majestically. 
I promise you, my friend, the writing of the golden papa speaks with a tongue of trumpets for itself. The note was plain, straightforward, and comprehensive, at any rate. It informed me, first, that Frederick Fairley, Esquire of Limeridge House, Cumberland, wanted to engage the services of a thoroughly competent drawing-master for a period of four months certain. Second, that the duties which the master was expected to perform would be of a twofold kind. He was to superintend the instruction of two young ladies in the art of painting in watercolours, and he was to devote his leisure time afterwards to the business of repairing and mounting a valuable collection of drawings, which had suffered to fall into the, a condition of total neglect. Thirdly, that the terms offered to the person who should undertake and properly perform these duties were four guineas a week, and that he was to reside at Limeridge House, and that he was to be treated there on the footing of a gentleman. Fourthly, and lastly, that no person need think of applying for this situation unless he could furnish the most unexceptionable references to character and abilities. The references were to be sent to Mr. Fairley's friend in London, who was empowered to conclude all necessary arrangements. These instructions were followed by the name and address of Pesca's employer in Portland Place, and there the note, or memorandum, ended. The prospect which this offer of an engagement held out was certainly an attractive one. The employment was likely to be both easy and agreeable. It was proposed to me at the autumn time of the year when I was least occupied, and the terms, judging by my personal experience in my profession, were surprisingly liberal. I knew this. I knew that I ought to consider myself very fortunate if I succeeded in securing the offered employment, and yet no sooner had I read the memorandum than I felt an inexplicable unwillingness within me to stir in the matter. I had never in the whole of my previous experience found my duty and my inclination so painfully and so unaccountably at variance as I found them now. "'Oh, Walter, your father never had such a chance as this,' said my mother, when she had read the note of terms and handed it back to me. "'Such distinguished people to know,' remarked Sarah, straightening herself in the chair, "'and on such gratifying terms of equality, too.' "'Yes, yes, the terms in every sense are tempting enough,' I replied impatiently. "'But before I send my testimonials, I should like a little time to consider—' "'Consider!' exclaimed my mother. "'Why, Walter, what is the matter with you?' "'Consider!' echoed my sister. "'What a very extraordinary thing to say under the circumstances!' "'Consider!' chimed in the professor. "'What is there to consider about? Answer me this. "'Have you not been complaining of your health? "'And have you not been longing for what you call a smack of the country breeze?' "'Well, there in your hand is the paper that offers you "'perpetual choking mouthfuls of country breeze for four months' time. "'Is it not so? Ha! Again you want money. "'Well, is four golden guineas a week nothing? "'My soul bless my soul! "'Only give it to me, and my boots shall creak like the golden papas "'with a sense of overpowering richness of the man who walks in them. Four guineas a week! "'And more than that!' the charming society of two young misses, and more than that, your bed, your breakfast, your dinner, and your gorging English teas and lunches, and drinks of foaming beer, and all for nothing. Why, Walter, my dear good friend, deuce what the deuce! For the first time in my life I have not eyes enough in my head to look and wonder at you. Neither my mother's evident astonishment at my behaviour, nor Pesca's fervid enumeration of the advantages offered to me by the new employment, had any effect in shaking my unreasonable disinclination to go to Limeridge House. After starting all the petty objections that I could think of to going to Cumberland, and after hearing them answered one after another, to my own complete discomfiture, I tried to set up a last obstacle by asking what was to become of my pupils in London while I was teaching Mr. Fairley's young ladies to sketch from nature. The obvious answer to this was that the greater part of them would be away on their autumn travels, and that the few who remained at home might be confided to the care of one of my brother drawing-masters, whose pupils I had once taken off his hands under similar circumstances. My sister reminded me that this gentleman had expressly placed his services at my disposal during the present season, in case I wished to leave town. My mother seriously appealed to me 
not to let an idle caprice stand in the way of my own interests and my own health, and Pesca piteously entreated that I would not wound him to the heart by rejecting the first grateful offer of service that he had been able to make to the friend who had saved his life. The evident sincerity and affection which inspired these remonstrances would have influenced any man with an atom of good feeling in his composition, though I could not conquer my own unaccountable perversity. I had at least virtue enough to be heartily ashamed of it, and to end the discussion pleasantly by giving way, and promising to do all that was wanted of me. The rest of the evening passed merrily enough in humorous anticipations of my coming life with the two young ladies in Cumberland. Pesca, inspired by a national grog, which appeared to get into his head in the most marvellous manner, five minutes after it had gone down his throat, asserted his claims to be considered a complete Englishman by making a series of speeches in rapid succession, proposing my mother's health, my sister's health, my health, and the healths in the mass of Mr. Fairley and the two young misses, pathetically returning thanks himself immediately afterwards for the whole party. "'A secret, Walter,' said my little friend confidentially, as we walked home together. "'I am flushed by the recollection of my own eloquence. My soul bursts itself with ambition. One of these days I go into your noble Parliament. It is the dream of my whole life to be Honourable Pesca MP.' The next morning I sent my testimonials to the Professor's employer in Portland Place. Three days passed, and I concluded with secret satisfaction that my papers had not been found sufficiently explicit. On the fourth day, however, an answer came. It announced that Mr. Fairley had accepted my services, and requested me to start for Cumberland immediately. All the necessary instructions for my journey were carefully and clearly added in the postscript. I made my arrangements, unwillingly enough, for leaving London early the next day. Towards evening Pesca looked in, on his way to a dinner-party, to bid me good-bye. I shall dry my tears in your absence, said the Professor gaily, with this glorious thought. It is my auspicious hand that has given the first push to your fortune in the world. Go, my friend. When your sun shines in Cumberland, English proverb, in the name of heaven make your hay. Marry one of the young misses. Become Honourable Hartwright MP. And when you are at the top of the ladder, remember that Pesca at the bottom has done it all. I tried to laugh with my little friend over his parting jest, but my spirits were not to be commanded. Something jarred in me almost painfully while he was speaking his light farewell words. When I was left alone again, nothing remained to be done but to walk to the Hampstead Cottage and bid my mother and Sarah good-bye. 4. The heat had been painfully oppressive all day, and it was now a close and sultry night. My mother and sister had spoken so many last words, and had begged me to wait another five minutes so many times, that it was nearly midnight when the servant locked the garden gate behind me. I walked forward a few paces on the shortest way back to London, then stopped and hesitated. The moon was full and broad in the dark blue starless sky, and the broken ground of the heath looked wild enough in the mysterious light to be hundreds of miles away from the great city that lay beneath it. The idea of descending any sooner than I could help into the heat and gloom of London repelled me. The prospect of going to bed in my airless chambers, and the prospect of gradual suffocation, seemed in my present restless state of mind and body to be one and the same thing. I determined to stroll home in the purer air by the most roundabout way I could take, to follow the white winding paths across the lonely heath, and to approach London through its most open suburb, by striking into Finchley Road, and so getting back in the cool of the new morning to the western side of Regent's Park. I wound my way down slowly over the heath, enjoying the divine stillness of the scene, and admiring the soft alternations of light and shade as they followed each other over the broken ground on every side of me. So long as I was proceeding through this first and prettiest part of my night walk, my mind remained passively open to the impressions produced by the view, and I thought but little on any subject. Indeed, so far as my own sensations were concerned, I can hardly say I thought at all. But, when I had left the heath and turned into the by-road, where there was less to see, the ideas naturally engendered by the approaching change in my habits and occupations, 
gradually drew more and more of my attention exclusively to themselves. By the time I'd arrived at the end of the road, I'd become completely absorbed in my own fanciful visions of Limeridge House, of Mr. Fairley, and of the two ladies whose practice in the art of watercolour painting I was so soon to superintend. I had now arrived at that particular point on my walk where four roads met, the road to Hampstead along which I had returned, the road to Finchley, the road to West End, and the road back to London. I had mechanically turned in this latter direction and was strolling along the lonely high road, idly wondering, I remember, what the Cumberland young ladies would look like, when, in one moment, every drop of blood in my body was brought to a stop by the touch of a hand laid lightly and suddenly on my shoulder from behind me. I turned on the instant, with my fingers tightening round the handle of my stick. There, in the middle of the broad, bright high road, there, as if it had that moment sprung out of the earth or dropped from the heaven, stood the figure of a solitary woman, dressed from head to foot in white garments, her face bent in grave inquiry on mine, her hand pointing to the dark cloud over London as I faced her. I was far too seriously startled by the suddenness with which this extraordinary apparition stood before me, in the dead of night and in that lonely place, to ask what she wanted. The strange woman spoke first. "'Is that the road to London?' she said. I looked attentively at her. As she put that singular question to me, it was nearly one o'clock. All I could discern distinctly by the moonlight was a colourless, youthful face, meagre and sharp to look at about the cheeks and chin, large, grave, wistful, attentive eyes, nervous, uncertain lips, and light hair of a pale, brownish-yellow hue. There was nothing wild, nothing immodest in her manner. It was quiet and self-controlled, a little melancholy and a little touched by suspicion, not exactly the manner of a lady, but at the same time not the manner of a woman in the humblest rank of life. The voice, little as I had yet heard of it, had something curiously still and mechanical in its tones, and the utterance was remarkably rapid. She held a small bag in her hand, and her dress, bonnet, shawl, and gown, all of white, was, so far as I could guess, certainly not composed of very delicate or very expensive materials. Her figure was slight, and rather above the average height. Her gait and actions, free from the slightest approach to extravagance, this was all I could observe of her in the dim light and under the perplexingly strange circumstances of our meeting. What sort of a woman she was, and how she came to be out alone in the high road an hour after midnight, I altogether failed to guess. The one thing of which I felt certain was that the grossest of mankind could not have misconstrued her motive in speaking, even at that suspiciously late hour, and in that suspiciously lonely place. "'Did you hear me?' she said, still quietly and rapidly, and without the least fretfulness or impatience. I asked if that was the way to London. "'Yes,' I replied, "'that's the way. It leads to St. John's Wood and Regent's Park. You must excuse my not answering you before. I was rather startled by your sudden appearance in the road, and I am even now quite unable to account for it. You don't suspect me of doing anything wrong, do you? I have done nothing wrong.' I have met with an accident. I am very unfortunate in being here alone so late. Why do you suspect me of doing wrong?" She spoke with unnecessary earnestness and agitation, and shrank back from me several paces. I did my best to reassure her. "'Or oh, pray don't suppose that I have any idea of suspecting you,' I said, "'or any other wish than to be of assistance to you, if I can. I only wondered at your appearance in the road, because it seemed to me to be empty the instant before I saw you.' She turned and pointed back to a place at the junction of the road to London and the road to Hampstead, where there is a gap in the hedge. "'I heard you coming,' she said, "'and hid there to see what sort of man you were before I risked speaking. I doubted and feared about it till you passed, and then I was obliged to steal after you and touch you.' "'Steal after me and touch me? Why not call to me?' Strange, to say the least of it. "'May I trust you?' she asked. "'You don't think the worse of me because I have met with an accident?' She stopped in confusion, shifted her bag from one hand to the other, and sighed bitterly. 
The loneliness and helplessness of the woman touched me. The natural impulse to assist her and to spare her got the better of the judgment, the caution, the worldly tact which an older, wiser, and colder man might have summoned to help him in this strange emergency. "'You may trust me for any harmless purpose,' I said. "'If it troubles you to explain your strange situation to me, don't think of returning to the subject again. I have no right to ask you for any explanations. Tell me how I can help you, and if I can, I will.' "'You're very kind, and I'm very, very thankful to have met you.' The first touch of womanly tenderness that I had heard from her trembled in her voice as she said these words. But no tears glistened in those large, wistfully attentive eyes of hers, which were still fixed on me. "'I've only been in London once before,' she went on, more and more rapidly, "'and I know nothing about that side of it yonder. Can I get a fly or a carriage of any kind? Is it too late? I don't know. If you could show me where to get a fly, and if you will only promise not to interfere with me, and to let me leave you—' When and how I please, I have a friend in London who will be glad to receive me. I want nothing else. Will you promise?" She looked anxiously up and down the road, shifted her bag again from one hand to the other, and repeated the words, "'Will you promise?' with a look hard in my face, with a pleading fear and confusion that it troubled me to see. What could I do? Here was a stranger, utterly and helplessly at my mercy, and that stranger a forlorn woman. No house was near. No one was passing whom I could consult. No earthly right existed on my part to give me a power of control over her, even if I had known how to exercise it. I trace these lines self-distrustfully, with the shadows of after-events darkening the very paper I write on. And still I say, what could I do? What I did do was try and gain time by questioning her. "'Are you sure that your friend in London will receive you at such a late hour as this?' I said. "'Quite sure. Only say you will let me leave you when and how I please. Only say you won't interfere with me. Will you promise?' As she repeated the words for the third time, she came close to me and laid her hand, with a sudden gentle stealthiness, on my bosom. A thin hand, a cold hand when I removed it with mine, even on that sultry night. Remember that I was young.' Remember that the hand that touched me was a woman's. Will you promise? Yes. One word. The little familiar word that is on everyone's lips every hour of the day. Oh, me! And I tremble now when I write it. We set our faces towards London, and walked on together in the first still hour of the new day. I and this woman, whose name, whose character, whose story, whose object in life, whose very presence at my side at that moment— were fathomless mysteries to me. It was like a dream. Was I Walter Hartwright? Was this the well-known, uneventful road, where holiday people strolled on Sundays? Had I really left, little more than an hour since, the quiet, decent, conventionally domestic atmosphere of my mother's cottage? I was too bewildered, too conscious also of a vague sense of something like self-reproach, to speak to my strange companion for some minutes. It was her voice again that first broke the silence between us. "'I want to ask you something,' she said suddenly. "'Do you know many people in London?' "'Yes, a great many.' "'Many men of rank and title?' There was an unmistakable tone of suspicion in the strange question. I hesitated about answering. "'Some,' I said, after a moment's silence. "'Many?' Uh, she came to a full stop then looked at me searchingly in the face. "'Many men of the rank of baronet?' Too much astonished to reply, I questioned her in my turn. "'Why do you ask?' "'Because I hope for my own sake that there is one baronet that you do not know.' "'Will you tell me his name?' "'I can't. I daren't. For I, I forget myself when I mention it.' She spoke loudly and almost fiercely, raised her clenched hand in the air and shook it passionately, and then on a sudden— controlled herself again, and added in tones lowered to a whisper, "'Tell me which of them you know.' I could hardly refuse to humour her in such a trifle, and I mentioned three names. Two the names of fathers of families whose daughters I taught, one the name of a bachelor, who had once taken me a, in a cruise on his yacht, to make sketches for him. "'Ah! You don't know him,' she said with a sigh of relief. 
Are you a man of rank and title yourself? Far from it. I am only a drawing-master. As the reply passed my lips, a little bitterly, perhaps, she took my arm with the abruptness which characterized all her actions. Not a man of rank and title, she repeated to herself. Thank God! I may trust him. I had hitherto contrived to master my curiosity out of consideration for my companion, but it got the better of me now. Oh, I'm afraid you have serious reason to complain of some man of rank and title? I asked. I am afraid the baronet, whose name you are unwilling to mention to me, has done you some grievous wrong. Is he the cause of your being out here at this strange time of night? Don't ask me. Don't make me talk of it, she answered. I'm not fit now. I have been cruelly used and cruelly wronged. You will be kinder than ever if you will walk on fast and not speak to me. I sadly want to quiet myself, if I can. We moved forward again at a quick pace, and for half an hour, at least, not a word passed on either side. From time to time, being forbidden to make any more inquiries, I stole a look at her face. It was always the same, the lips close shut, the brow frowning, the eyes looking straight forward, eagerly yet absently. We had reached the first houses, and were close to the new Wesleyan College, before her set features relaxed, and she spoke once more. "'Do you live in London?' she said. "'Yes,' I answered. It struck me that she might have formed some intention of appealing to me for assistance or advice, and that I ought to spare her a possible disappointment by warning her of my approaching absence from home. So I added, "'But to-morrow I shall be away from London for some time. I am going into the country.' "'Where?' she asked. "'North or south?' "'North to Cumberland.' "'Cumberland?' She repeated the word tenderly. "'Ah! I wish I was going there, too. I was once happy in Cumberland.' I tried again to lift the veil that hung between this woman and me. "'Perhaps you were born,' I said, "'in that beautiful lake country.' "'No,' she answered. "'I was born in Hampshire. "'But I once went to school for a little while in Cumberland. "'Lakes? I don't remember any lakes. "'It's Limeridge Village and Limeridge House I should like to see again.' "'It was my turn now to stop suddenly. "'In the excited state of my curiosity at that moment, "'the chance reference to Mr. Fairley's place of residence— on the lips of my strange companion, staggered me with astonishment. "'Did you hear anybody calling after us?' she asked, looking up and down the road affrightedly. The instant I stopped. "'No, no, I, w I was only struck by the name of Limeridge House. I heard it mentioned by some Cumberland people a few days since.' "'Ah, not my people. Mrs. Fairley is dead, and her husband is dead, and their little girl may be married and gone away by this time. I can't say who lives at Limeridge now.' If any more are left there of that name, I only know I love them for Mrs. Fairley's sake. She seemed about to say more, but while she was speaking we came within view of the turnpike at the top of the avenue road. Her hand tightened round my arm, and she looked anxiously at the gate before us. "'Is the turnpike man looking out?' she asked. He was not looking out. No one else was near the place when we passed through the gate. The sight of the gas-lamps and houses seemed to agitate her, and to make her impatient. "'This is London,' she said. "'Do you see any carriage I can get? I'm tired and frightened. I want to shut myself in and be driven away.' I explained to her that we must walk a little further to get to a cab-stand, unless we were fortunate enough to meet with an empty vehicle, and then I tried to resume the subject of Cumberland. It was useless. The idea of shutting herself in and being driven away had now got full possession of her mind. She could think and talk of nothing else. We had hardly proceeded a third of the way down Avenue Road when I saw a cab draw up at a house a few doors below us, on the opposite side of the way. A gentleman got out and let himself in at the garden door. I hailed the cab, as the driver mounted the box again. When we crossed the road my companion's impatience increased to such an extent that she almost forced me to run. "'It's so late,' she said. "'I'm only in a hurry because it's so late.' "'Can't take you, sir, if you're not going towards Tottenham Court Road,' said the driver civilly, when I opened the cab door. "'My horse is dead beat. I can't get him to go no further than the stable.' "'Yes, yes, that will do for me. I'm going that way. I'm going that way,' she spoke with breathless eagerness, and pressed by me into the cab. I had assured myself that the man was sober as well as civil before I let her enter the vehicle, and now, 
When she was seated inside, I entreated her to let me see her set down safely at her destination. No, 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 she said vehemently. I'm quite safe, and I'm quite happy now. If you're a gentleman, remember your promise. Let him drive on till I stop him. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. My hand was on the cab door. She caught it in hers, kissed it, and pushed it away. The cab drove off at the same moment. I started into the road with some vague idea of stopping it again. I hardly knew why. Hesitated from dread of frightening and distressing her. Called at last, but not so loudly, as to attract the driver's attention. The sound of the wheels grew fainter in the distance. The cab melted into the black shadows on the road. The woman in white was gone. Ten minutes or more had passed. I was still on the same side of the way, now mechanically walking forward a few paces, now stopping again absently. At one moment I found myself doubting the reality of my own adventure. At another I was perplexed and distressed by an uneasy sense of having done wrong, which yet left me confusedly ignorant of how I could have done right. I hardly knew where I was going, or what I meant to do next. I was conscious of nothing but the confusion of my own thoughts, when I was abruptly recalled to myself, awakened, I must almost say, by the sound of rapidly approaching wheels close behind me. I was on the dark side of the road, in the thick shadow of some garden trees, when I stopped to look round. On the opposite and lighter side of the way, a short distance below me, a policeman was strolling along in the direction of Regent's Park. A carriage passed me, an open chaise driven by two men. "'Stop!' cried one. "'There's a policeman. Let's ask him.' The horse was instantly pulled up, a few yards beyond the dark place where I stood. "'Policeman!' cried the first speaker. "'Have you seen a woman pass this way?' "'What sort of woman, sir?' "'A woman in a lavender-coloured gown.' "'No, no,' interposed the second man. "'The clothes we gave her were found on her bed. She must have gone away in the clothes she wore when she came to us. In white, policeman. A woman in white.' "'I haven't seen her, sir. If you or any of your men meet with the woman, stop her, and send her in careful keeping to that address. I'll pay all expenses and a fair reward into the bargain. The policeman looked at the card that was handed down to him. Why are we to stop her, sir? What's she done? Done? She's escaped from my asylum. Don't forget, a woman in white. Drive on. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Good place to end. No. So, we now have a uh, heart right. And of course, his name is... Ah, uh, meaningful, I think we can believe. And, uh, and we have Pesca, and we have Hartwright's family, and we have a situation, and his dread. His dread of his upcoming position that he will be taking at Limbridge House. Now, in between, when I recorded the first half of the podcast and today, lots has happened, including my husband has left for Virginia, and we had a garage sale, and a birthday party, and a going away party, so it's been a bit of time. And in that gap, something wonderful has happened for you. One of our fabulous listeners, Jill, who lives nearby where I will soon be living, sent some gorgeous yarn for an incentive. And it is Valentine's Day colored yarn from NeighborhoodFiberCompany.com. You can check them out. This is Grant Circle is the name of the colorway. It is worsted weight yarn. It is 100% superwash merino, 98 yards, 2 ounces per skein. It's uh, about 4.5 to 5 stitches per inch on U.S. size 6 to 8. And this can be yours. <laughs> if you donate to Craftlet during the month of January and the first two weeks of the month of February, I will actually have the drawing here in my little study that's missing half of its furniture. <laughs> I will have the drawing on February 14th and then announce who won the five skeins of gorgeous yarn on the following show. I'll also have a picture of the yarn up for you so you can see what it looks like if you wish to donate. By the time you hear this, there will be a button to the new Craftlit 2011 tour with Amy Detchen and uh, all sorts of fabulous things. Diane will still be there. And some news. Um, we miscommunicated on Yom Kippur and it's starting and stuff. So here's how it's going to work. 
if you are of the tribe and you still wish to go on the trip, you can do what I am going to do and get there early, travel on the 7th, and then on the 8th, we will proceed to Yom Kippur services together because that night, the night of the 8th, is our opening banquet. What better way to break the fast than doing it with Craftlet friends? So, that's the news on that. There will be more news on the What Would Madame Defarge Knit book coming at you very soon. Lots of stuff happening. Really gorgeous, wonderful things. And um, I think that's it. It's been such a crazy, crazy couple of weeks. I hope you enjoyed the beginning of this book. It is so fabulous. And that, you know, it takes a little while to meet our characters, but I, I hope that that last scene between Walter Hartwright and the woman in white stirred your interest enough to keep you coming back because it's worth it. You're going to love Wilkie Collins. He's fantastic. Have a great week. Take care of yourself and your family. Lots of extra hugs. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Please remember to support the people who support Craftlit. Visit Knitting Out Loud. Listen while you knit. And Knit Circus online magazine offering three rings of knitting, sewing, and fun. You can check out the winter issue at www.knitcircus.com. And Scribe Tutor, the online writing tutor offering personalized and convenient writing help for all ages. You can find more about Scribe Tutor at scribetutor.com. And please visit the blogs and sites of Craftlet supporters. Those links can be found in the sidebar of the show notes. The show notes can be found at craftlet.com. Craftlet can also be accessed by its own iPhone application. You can purchase it at the iPhone or iTouch application store, or you can subscribe free at iTunes. Craftlet is made possible by the generous support of its listeners, and for that, I am truly grateful. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.